Hi, everybody. How's it Hello, going? <laughs> All right. We I are live. We are live. Awesome. I wonder if it's stream. Oh, yeah, there we are. Yeah. Welcome to the light gate, everybody. <laughs> from the great place, the city of New Orleans on UPRN at 107.7 and the United Paranormal Network at 105.3. We are on Roku, YouTube, uh, sometimes rum, uh, Tumblr, Rumbler, some one of those. Rumble. Yeah, Facebook and many <laughs> others. Our Roku people are only hearing us, so we will promise you that we will give you good descriptions of everything. And we're ready to go. Preston, who are we talking to today? <laughs> Yeah, well, our guest is great, but first let me introduce myself. I'm Preston Dennett, and my lovely co-host is Dolly Safran. She's an experiencer. I'm an author and a little bit of an experiencer, not quite to the extent Dolly is, but I think we're all experiencers. But yeah, we do have an amazing guest. We've got a bunch of people in the chat room already. Very excited to see you all. Let's see, there's Brian Morgan. Brigitte is with us, former guest. Hi, Brigitte. There's Don Curtis. Oh, lots of you guys. Gray Troll, thanks for joining us. Louise. Oh, my goodness. I'm excited, you guys. Hi, Dana. Real Badger. Very good. Susan. Yay. There's Janice. Hi, Janice. Well, I see all of you here. If you have any questions, remember, type them in in caps, and we will get to them at some point. Hi, Stacy. Well, I could actually talked about you guys for a long time because there's a lot of you. Scuba, Maru, hello, Rad Peanut. But let's get started because I'm super excited about our amazing guest. And let me just pull up her bio. Our guest tonight is Katie Page. Dolly and I actually met Katie Page at UFOCon? UFOCon. UFOCon, in San, yeah. San, San, San Francisco, Francisco a couple of years ago. And I listened to her presentation. I was really impressed. She's a really intelligent and funny person. And I really enjoyed speaking with her. And here is her bio. Katie Page has personal ties to a high strangeness ranch in Colorado. In UFO folklore, it was known as the Clearview Ranch and predates the infamous Skinwalker Ranch by over a decade. This is what motivated her interest in ufology to find answers to all her experiences. Now, Katie has been in uf ufology for a while. She is Colorado's MUFON state director. She is also a star investigator for MUFON and is actually the team lead and administrator for MUFON's Mars team. She's the host of MUFON's What's Up radio broadcast on KGRADB.com along with her co-hosts, Chris DiPerno and Tara, oh my gosh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, Deulis, I think that's right. Katie also conducts independent investigations and research, and she has been a presenter at several conferences and has appeared on many radio shows and podcasts, including the great Coast to Coast with George Knapp, Spaced Out Radio, UAP Studies Podcast, and many others. Now she's also been on TV a bunch, actually. She was seen on Travel Channel's UFO Witness. Hey, I did that show. Gaia's Beyond Belief with George Norrie. History Channel's Ancient Aliens. Oh, cool. Small Town Monsters. On the Trail of UFOs. Night Visitors. Ron James' new film, Accidental Truth, which, by the way, is a multiple award winner. And she's going to be appearing on a new series on the History Channel. Now, Katie is not only an experiencer and an investigator. She is an author as well. She's the author of a very well-received book. I hope, totally recommend it. It's called Letters of Love and Light. Four decades of UFO encounters, experiences, and sightings shared with ufologist R. Leo Sprinkle, Ph.D., and if you don't know Dr. Sprinkle, you should. He's an absolute pioneer in this field, and I believe he's actually the first to use hypnotic regression to help people who've had missing time. Now, Katie is currently writing her second book, which is going to be what we're talking about tonight, mostly, but we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. Her second book will be called High Strangeness on a Colorado Ranch, the Colorado Skinwalker 
ranch. The subtitle is craft, cattle, copters, cryptids, and cover-ups. So we are super excited to have Katie join us tonight, and I will just bring her in right now. Oh, there she is. Hi, Katie. Hi, Preston. <laughs> Hi, Dolly. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, really? yes, we can. Now I'm okay. going to add a picture because I want to show you this, Katie. There we are. <laughs> we oh, met. I remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, this is Katie with Dolly on the right and me on the left. And this is where we met at the co or UFO Con run by Lorian Fenton. And yeah, I was really impressed. I got didn't get to see all the speakers, but I certainly heard yours. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you have an amazing story to tell. Yes. Absolutely. But when we started this show, I knew I, that you were on my list, my short list. Well, so. I appreciate that. No, that was a great time, wasn't it? I just love all these conferences. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> Yeah, great, you're, great way you're... to get to know people for sure and i want to apologize to your listeners ahead of time i am up here in the rocky mountains the beautiful rocky mountains of colorado and i you know this spring we had this big wet heavy snow and i had this, my shovel and i was up there getting the dripping water up and i cut my um, severed my Starlink cord. So it's just sort of taped. <laughs> and so it's kind of hit or miss my internet. I'm going to do the best I can with it, but I have a new Starlink ordered, so that'll be fixed shortly. So bear with me if I freeze in funny places. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just did very slightly, just to, just for yeah. two seconds, but it was kind of funny. <laughs> but, or, I mean, we've got so much to talk about. I'm really excited about your connection with Leo Sprinkle. I've always considered him such a hero in this field. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and he was a genuine, you know, unfortunately, we lost him in 2021. He passed. But he was such a pioneer, and I was so fortunate to get to know him and to honor him. And really, that that book for me was just this this drive of just respect for him. And I just got lost in all those letters that people had written to him. And the cool part about that was um, that he had saved through all those decades, his return letters. So it was sort of like wow. I kind of got to see his progression of thought and what he believed was going on for those decades. And I included those in the book as well. And not only did he talk to people like Linda Moulton Howe, and he even talked to, you know, the debunkers in the field as well, Phil Class. So I kind of got to peek in under the veil between you know, his letters between him and Phil Class and others. But also he taught he spoke with children and experiencers and, and everybody. And I really just pulled out all the juicy parts, you know, when people described the ETs or the craft or they a lot of people talked about, you know, was this a, a memory or was this a dream? And it's so funny when experiencers and I don't know, Dolly, if you've experienced that dreams that almost seem more real than this waking life. A lot of people wrote to him about that. Yeah. Yes. Yep. When I was much so, younger. I, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. It was, it was cool right. to get to know him. So, so wow. how did you end up getting to know him though? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So, you know, with this ranch, it was known as the Clearview Ranch. And um, when, you know, I'm nine to 12 years old during these years and we were threatened and warned never to talk about what happened out there by the adults and by this really scary experience we had out there on the ranch. And so I never knew anybody knew anything about the ranch or I never knew it was investigated. And when I first got into um, investigating and research, I purchased a book called Hunt for the Skinwalker by George Knapp and Colm Kellyher. And I, I opened that book and in that book was a chapter called Other Hot Spots and started reading about the Colorado Ranch. And I knew immediately just because of the interesting dynamics of the family um, that had to be the ranch of my childhood. And, and in there, it talked about three PhDs that were investigators out there. Dr. Leo Sprinkle was one of them, along with Peter Van Arsdale, PhD, and John Durr, seismologist, PhD. Um, so immediately, um, the, the wow. state director for MUFON at the time was Doug Wilson, and I, I got Dr. Leo's contact information. He's only a short two and a half hour drive from where I live in Colorado at the time, <laughs> to Laramie, Wyoming. And he has, so 
anybody can go access Dr. Sprinkle's archives. There's 72 boxes of this man's lifetime of work in the field. You just go wow. down to Laramie, Wyoming, Wyoming, to the Heritage Center, and you can check out and just like I did, I spent weekends several times going through his his wow. um, data. Um, and, and that's how I got to know Leo. And I pulled, he had all the original documents from the investigation out there on the ranch. And so many of my memories, my mom's memories and my sister's memories were, um, you know, they, right, they were right there in black and white in writing. And then John Schusler, um, I just want to give a shout out to John Schusler, who unfortunately just lost his wife recently. So my heart is with John and his family. Um, however, he learned of my connection to the ranch and he knew about it for all these decades because it was also investigated by APRO. Um, mm -hmm. And so he gave me the original big briefing document of the investigation that APRO did on that ranch property, which was again, validation to so many of our personal experiences that, you know, when you're that young, you start questioning, you know, your own memories, like you're nine, 10 years old, like, wow, did that really happen? And for me, you know, this is the prime time of all the stuff was in 1977. And we all know it came out in 1977, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And I saw this <laughs> right. movie and I'm like, I thought it was a documentary because I'm living that. Crap, you know? <laughs> but wow. anyway, so it's kind of funny yeah. to look back on that. But, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I first came to the attention of this ranch in a book by Timothy Good. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a book called UFOs Over Colorado. And I think this is kind of what brought us together because you saw that right. and you're like, Hey, <laughs> I hey, actually live. I know this. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Preston, we need to talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, You've that... written so many great books, Preston. And what you do is just invaluable. Gathering all that data from all these locations and, and putting them in books like that is a wonderful service to all of us. So thank you for all the work you do. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. super excited that you're writing a, a whole book on this because <laughs> having listened to your presentation on it, I know you have a lot to tell. So yeah, why don't we just get started? Because you were there as a little girl, right? Yes, I'm dying to know about your very first memory that you have experience and how it affected well, my, you. My very first memory I have. So it, it was interesting. My mother worked for United Airlines. She was a computer operator here at the Denver Tech Center in, in Colorado. And she dated the gentleman that owned the ranch. So it's I want to make that clear. I did not live on this ranch full time. I visited mm -hmm. on the weekends because the, the, the family, my mom's boyfriend had three sons, two of the, mm -hmm. the youngest sons, lived with us during the week to attend a larger school district, the Cherry Creek School District, which is a big school district. And in the area where this is in Elbert County, Colorado, you know, at that time in the late, there was like six in the graduating class. So they wanted their sons to, to go to a larger district to have more opportunities there. So we would commute them back and forth to visit their mom and spend time on the ranch on the weekends. Um, so my first memory, Dolly, is just hearing my mom and her boyfriend, Jack, who has passed away now. Um, actually, all three of the adults that lived there full time have now passed away. So yeah. I think it's important to do these why we can and get to these witnesses why we can. Um, but uh, they, when, when they first purchased the property, they heard these humming sounds um, and these bangs and sounds coming from underground when there was nothing there that would be causing these. And just yesterday, and they love doing podcasts and conferences because the more you speak about these things, more witnesses come forward. So just yesterday, I drove to Colorado Springs and did an interview with a, a, a kid. He's 29 years old, grew up out in that area, and he and his friends have experienced some unbelievable things out there. So it was a fantastic interview with him. And I asked him about if they're still hearing sounds out there in the woods. So out in this area, you have patches of like ponderosa pines where mm -hmm. it's kind of really wooded, but you also have, you know, very flat, open areas for cattle to graze and whatnot. So it's in Elbert County, Colorado. And, you know, it wasn't just this ac activity wasn't just isolated to the family's ranch that I was connected to, although we had a lot of unusual things happen there. And, and some I witnessed myself, it was this whole area of an Elbert County, it went from Franktown to Elizabeth, to Kiowa, to Simla, to Rama. So it's this whole like parallel where these things occurred. And interestingly, in, in investigating the, the history of the ranch, we had very, very heavy, you know, we had the Ute 
Cheyenne, Navajo, Pawnee, wow. Kiowa, Comanche, Sioux. Um, this was, um, we had the Sand Creek Massacre occur, which was one of American history's worst tragedies. Um, and so th there was a lot of horrific events that occurred in and around this area. Now, I don't know if that plays a role to some of these things, but it possibly could. I know they discussed that as Skinwalker as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very That's amazing. So the sounds. So yeah. I have, you, you sent me some pictures, and I'm going to pull one of them up when you're a little girl. Is that all right? Which That's shows fine. Some of, <laughs> shows some of the physical symptoms you experienced. Here, let me see if I can add this. Yeah, that's a whole other interesting thing. As Dolly knows and so many other people know, you know, I lived about an hour away from the ranch. We, we lived in Englewood, Colorado. It's now Centennial, Colorado. So... I compartmentalized these things that I was experiencing. I was seeing shadow figures in my room. I was, I, well, the night, the, the scariest night coming back from the ranch house, what happened? It was the mom's boys' birthday. It was a Saturday night. We're all there celebrating. It's, it's early in the morning around midnight, even maybe a little after midnight. The adults are playing board games, partying, whatever. Me and, the, me and my sister and the three boys are hanging out in the boys' bedroom when the power goes out in the house and that humming sound starts up. And any time that humming sound started up, you knew something was going to happen. It seemed unusual things would always happen when we, we would hear this hum. And sure enough, the power goes out in the house and we see the brightest light. Bright, I describe it as being brighter than the sun. No helicopter noise, no nothing. It was outside the window. That's when that it sounded like this mechanical sounding voice came out of every orifice of the house. And it wasn't until I received the briefing document from John Schusler, which is right here, in that it had verbatim reported back when it happened, which was amazing for my sister and I, because we literally had like a PTSD response to it when we saw it. It basically said, when all the power is out in the house, so we don't know how this is being transmitted into the house, we have allowed you to remain. We have interfered with your lives very little. Do not cause us to take action you will regret. Your, fr your friends will be warned to remain silent concerning us. And that's where the threat and the warning came from, was that electronic voice. And my thought was, how much of this was military? Because through Dr. Sprinkle's files, we learned that people from Camp um, uh, Camp Carson were out there. His name was France or Warren Blank from Fort Carson was out on the ranch. So I'm like, why is the military out on the ranch? We knew NORAD was aware of the ranch property. I talked to Richard Doty and Laughlin. He was aware of the ranch property. We knew Air Force wow. was aware of the ranch property. So, and now with all this new news coming out with David Grush and I mean, isn't this a crazy time right now? A week ago today, Monday, we have this, this news come out, right? This back engineer technology. And he's talking about over 2000 black access projects right. and, that the air force and other, you know, others have. So I'm thinking how much of this was secretive black access projects, mutilations out there. This is where Linda Moulton Howe got her start. And I was just recently at contact in the desert and I got to reconnect with Linda Howe. And, and that for me was coming full circle because at the time, Linda Moulton Howe was an investigative journalist out here in Colorado. And these rash of mutilations were occurring almost daily. And Elbert County was the he heaviest hit. So we had cow, horse, sheep, even dog. People were arming themselves with shotguns by the door. People, I mean, we even Stapleton Airport at the time, DIA wasn't there at this time. We had Stapleton. They actually went, uh, issued a no-fly zone over the county because mutilations <laughs> were so high. Um, there was um, high rewards from the Cattlemen's Association actively looking for these mute people perpetrating these mutilations. And, you know, I always give Linda Moulton Howe big credit because she really started the investigations on these mutilations along with Christopher O'Brien and Chuck Zukowski. And again, I was at a conference recently here in Cripple Creek, Colorado, and Chuck Zukowski was there. And it was wonderful to talk with him about where he stands on these mutilations. Because as we all know, they're still to this day. Um, they're kind of picking up again, actually. I know there was just a few of them in Texas, one in Oklahoma. And in, in the investigations, that, I've yeah. gone out is um are you am, am i okay can you guys still hear me yeah am I okay. okay um you know the in investigations i've done 
a lot of these small towns and ranchers, they don't report these anymore. They know nothing's going to happen. Um, they don't like the stigmas. But if you actually go to these small towns and talk with these ranchers, the best thing to do, little tip for anybody who wants to go investigate any of this, go into your local bars, <laughs> you know, the local small town bars, <laughs> and just right. talk to the folks, you know, and say, hey, I'm investigating this. Have you ever? And you would be amazed. At how many people will go, oh, my gosh, this happened, this happened, this happened. But as far as the symptoms, getting back to that, I kind of went off there. Um, I compartmentalized all those other things that were happening to me. And it really wasn't until Skinwalkers at the Pentagon came out, that second book, um, that they started talking about people who would visit Skinwalker Ranch and other high strangest locations will, would have this hitchhiker effect. And they, too, would um, have shadow figures these balls of light or blue orbs, sometimes white orbs in their rooms. Um, that sense of feeling watched was really super intense for me. Um, I always felt like I was watched so much so in elementary school, if a car or motorcycle drove by, I'd like run up to the nearest house and pretend I lived there because I was always afraid of being, I don't know if you can relate to that dolly, um, but yes, um, it, was con it was constant fear. I never slept alone. I slept with big sister all the time. Um, wow. So a lot of those kind of things, paranormal things in the house all the time. And interestingly enough, the interview I just did yesterday with this young man, um, he and his friends are experiencing very similar things. Oh, a, he when he said he has a sense of being watched, I was like, oh, my goodness, um, that was super intense. And this kind of, you know, I asked him if they still feel like an uneasiness or an eerie feeling because that area especially in those wood lines, it can feel very uneasy and eerie. They also had Sasquatch beings out there as well. So, so much stuff was going on. So Unmarked you were pretty young. You, you were pretty young. Yeah, actually that, time. yeah, those two pictures right there are me during those years. Um, wow. So that, that was how old I was when all this was going on. And to keep that a secret was really, really difficult. Luckily, my sister and I had each other to lean on and to talk talk to we even created our own little secret kind of like pig latin language that we would talk you know so we can like because we would hear the adults we'd hear my mom and her boyfriend talking about police being called and these mutilations being done and another one was found and we knew something was going on especially because chris and i experienced that scary night on the ranch and then one day we were on the ranch we were just flipping the frisbee it was like your typical spring snow colorado will get these late snows in the spring but it's nice out, the sunshine, the sky's blue. We're flipping the Frisbee. We looked down and there was this perfect circle where nothing grew and it was completely dry. But on the outside of the circle was this wet, heavy snow. And I still remember it very clearly to this day because it was so strange. And also in a lot of the reports, a few different places, there were two of these circles and the investigators actually measured them. They were 75 feet in diameter. And in one of the reports, it says there were droplets of blood in the snow outside of the snow lip snowless circle so to have validation of my childhood memories through these reports has been just enormous it's been very therapeutic for both my sister and i to have that validation of, of did, memories. Uh, all of these things that you were experiencing did they tend to keep you on property more in other words you all didn't go out exploring in the hills or yeah. no you... no in fact the boys were pretty frightened i mean as these things were going on um another memory we had so um, they had a pickup truck and behind, so the ranch house sits here and behind is this bank of Ponderosa pine wooded area. And there was, um, you know, where you could drive the truck behind the ranch house for quite a ways. And we were getting something out of this outbuilding by the bank of trees. And we had stopped the pickup truck to get out and we had the dogs in the back of the truck. And, you know, we just, we were in the back of the truck. We didn't sit inside the bed of the truck. And all of a sudden, again, this, noise this hum although this it sounded sort of like bees or if you've ever stood under like electrical wires like that you know that sound and then we look back and about four feet above the ground was this lit box and the adult is yelling at me and the youngest son to get back in the truck get back in the truck and we're scrambling to get back in the truck again we're hearing that strange noise and we look back and that box was gone and I didn't talk about, because it's so strange that this happened, but the police officer, Bill Wall, experienced this disappearing box. Um, his posse sheriff um, also saw it. all the adults in the house. So there were like three or four witnesses that experienced that box. And in fact, in the, in the report, it says that this box was lethal. 
and it could take down a Sasquatch. It could just take him down to his knees. And I had a, a lady approach me after uh, my conference in Laughlin and she had a couple interesting theories and I, and I like both of the theories. She said, do you think that this box was emitting some sort of um, tone or frequency that would calm the cattle and herd the cattle? Because when talking to ranchers that were experiencing these mutilations, uh, they would tell me that in the pastures where the mutilations were occurring, the cattle would all herd together and remain really calm. But in the adjoining pastures, they would be all freaked out and, you know, all over the place. And so I thought that was interesting. Or was the box used as like some sort of communication device? Both good theories. I Probably don't know. Both. I, I yeah. lived on a dairy farm when I was very young. And uh, one thing I can tell you about cows and cattle, um, also a Burma ranch, uh, is that they're curious as cats. And yeah. if you make a sound or anything that catches their attention, they will all gather for it. And they're, oh, wow. they're like, Boom, what is that? And they'll stare at it for an hour. I'm not kidding you. And it's one unique thing about cattle that's absolutely, you talk to a cattle rancher and they'll tell you that. If you walk along the fence line, everybody's following you. It, they're cats, okay? They're like curious. So if there's a box there, they're going to herd and be curious herd about it. And look at it and be, and, and be all calm about it. Like, huh, what is oh, that? And they're waiting for somebody to go, no dangerous run. And then everybody will. But it, at the beginning, they're looking it over really hard. Right. Um, right. So, wow. So what is your, what, after all these years and everything, have you got a consensus of what you really think? It's, I think you have more than one thing going on out there and I'm curious. Oh, oh yeah. Well, that's why I want to pull up this slide because <laughs> this is not just UFOs. It's not just Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, it's not just military presence. It's not just yeah. MTs. I mean, what the heck? This is yeah. right. <laughs> right. And and for me, I mean, this is why I'm like 11 plus years in on all this now, because there's so many avenues to go down. Right. Are we talking interdimensionals, interdimensional with the Sasquatch, the crypto creatures, the paranormal activity, how that was with the mysterious helicopters and the military presence? Again, you know, is this, is this the military causing this or are they trying to investigate what has been going on there for a long time. And, and Dolly, where I stand really right now is. Oh, we froze here. Okay. Let's try it again. Oh, there you are. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, where, you know, I always ask, is it chicken or the egg was the military creating this or were they investigating? And one thing I came across in looking at the provenance of the land itself, um, there was a, a gentleman named Dick Mulligan, and he had was born and raised on this ranch property. And he, in Winter Park Ski Resort, there's a um, ski run called Mulligan's Mile. And they talk about him in the on the internet as being having a bold gift of exaggeration, right? Tall, telling tall tales. And I'm like, well, if he grew up on that ranch property, he probably wasn't telling tall tales. And in fact, there's been years and years that predated this orbs of light are flying on and off this property orbs are happening and i think this activity has been going on way before the military was aware of it Ooh, so okay okay yeah. so i think i think that both things were happening at the same time i think the strangeness happens and then the military became aware of it and they're in they're investigating it as well so yeah. now we have both going on at the same time okay, so now, we have a uh, question yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll read this question from night 2255 because people are curious about the box. Were there any markings on the box or what did yeah, it look I like? Can, I can read you where it talks about the box in here so I get it exactly right. Oh, let me get my glasses on here. I'm yes. sorry about my connection, guys. I really need to get that fixed. Yeah, once more. Um, what did the box look like? Yeah, <laughs> I'm curious yeah, too. Um, yeah, um, let's see. Um, so this was, um, so the box was close to the window within about two or three feet. There was a, a line of trees behind the house and it was between the trees in the house. Um, the trees were about four or five, five feet from the house. Um, we all ran outside. Let's see. So they described the box as being the shiny black box. It was a triangular patches where the lectern was lit up. Let's see. 
So it said it was black and very shiny. Hmm. And the way I remember it, it was bigger, quite a bit bigger than shoebox, like a shoebox and a half in this light. And there were lights on it. Um, and it made this B sound, like this electric kind of B sound. And in the document, it, when they approached it, the tone, that tone would change more to like an angry B sound. Um, so, yeah. And the Bill Waugh, the under, if I flew to Florida to um, interview his son and his widow, Jean, and they remember his dad and the posse sheriff encountering the box, not on the ranch property, but on this road where there was no road. And he was afraid to approach the box. And so he goes, gets the posse sheriff, they come back and they're watching as the box and what he says, the trees almost appeared to go into the ground. That's what the sheriff reported which just sounds, and he even talks about it in Dr. Sprinkles that he didn't want to report it. He didn't want the stigma. He didn't want the attention, but he actually saw this box, what he appeared to go under the ground. So wow. very unusual. And I know Skinwalker Ranch had an encounter with the box as well. Really? So what, this what is year was this? Um, these this years were, yeah, this was 1975 to 1978. Those, yeah. those years. Yeah. And there, the red star there is where the ranch sits. Um, and then as you can see, there's so many military installations around the Air Force Academy, yeah. NORAD, Fort Carson, Peterson, Shrivener. And then we also have um, Butte, which is one of the largest collections of military helicopters out there. That's another phenomenon that was going on at the time, were these unmarked copters flying on and off properties. And the witness I talked to yesterday, that's still going on to this day a lot. And so I told him to start keeping a journal of when and where he's seeing these things. Um, so I find that interesting. And then of course, on the other side of the Springs, you know, we have where Snippy the horse was, was first discovered uh, and Snippy was actually named lady. But so we have both sides of Colorado Springs area that would have um, high strangeness, I would say, you know, happening. So it's really an interesting area. And the black forest was pretty active as well. It's pretty ever, close to Cheyenne Mountain, too. Yeah. Have you ever yeah, had any Cheyenne documentation or talk about underground facilities for the military out there? Well, you know, there's um, there's Dulce in New Mexico, and there's there's researchers there that believe that these underground tunnels do run. I mean, it would not surprise me at all. I mean, we know Cheyenne Mountain goes underground, and I'm yeah. sure they have tunnels connecting to those. I don't know if it's connecting now out to DIA, if if yeah. it connects uh, to Dulce, to other military installations, who knows? But I know there's other researchers that investigate this. Yeah. So, it's been my experience the, with bases and things like that, that they employ all kinds of methods for keeping people off their property. They, they will uh, do things that scare you. They will um, have the ability to communicate with you out loud verbally, and you don't know where it's coming from. They will use uh, sound scare tactics, they will, uh, I mean, there's a thousand different ways to keep people off a, a, a property. They don't want you there. Right. And well, with this ranch, just, just, um, I was going to say real quick, not, um, but just today um, we had, um, you know, Dr. Stephen Greer doing this UAP uh, UFO disclosure press conference, yeah, right? We watched it. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and he brings up a slide. And he talks about these crimes committed, right, by illegal covert projects. Right. And I'm reading this list. And just like what Dolly said, you're talking treason against the United States, murder, right. torture, kidnapping and abduction, um, money laundering, fraud, theft, trespassing, blackmail, bribery, um, harassing of witnesses, and on and on and on. And I'm thinking, was any of this going on at the ranch? There were evidence of perhaps some MK Ultra things going on out there where in Dr. Sprinkle's files, they talked to this gentleman, um, Warren redacted out, visits the ranch, felt something take over his mind, made him walk towards the woods, released him, and he would run back to the ranch house and the, did this to him five times. Now, that speaks to me as some sort of mind control. And right. you bring up also a good, let's look at the Providence that that 10 to 12 years before my mom's boyfriend's family purchased the ranch if the government wanted to own that property 
why didn't they just purchase it? It doesn't make any sense to me why they would go through these tactics to do all that, to scare us and others. Because it just got like really pegs to the uh, black alts. And uh, yeah, they you were an experiment, literally. You were one of many. That's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, they I, I really of, feel that deep down. Yeah, they've been doing stuff since before I was even born. And uh, it's it's a long history with them. We had two paranoid presidents. It got worse after that. And nobody told anybody else what was going on. And, you know, the alternate or, you know, gov you know, the, the guys who are running all those dark programs uh, felt free to do anything they wanted. They had no laws against them at all. And that is absolutely true. I know that uh, for a fact. And um, it's, right. it's interesting. I, I wonder and that, that Go ahead. That would speak to that would speak to their liability. Then why the Air Force is remaining so hush hush? Why the Navy's kind of come out? I don't think the Navy wanted to come out on purpose. I think you know they kind of had to speak up about what was leaked out there with Go Fast and Gimbal, uh, and, and that. But in the Tic Tac videos, but I think the Air Force has been remaining hush hush because they they have liability issues with so many of these. So you know I don't want right. to consider myself a victim and you a victim, but there's a lot of people, if these, if they've done these experiments to people, then yeah, they're liable. Right. Well, I think that's one reason for disclosure not to happen at all. Okay. Right. Because we, we all get a really inside look at what they've actually been up to and doing, and they have to admit things that they didn't want to admit. Um, mm -hmm. I think disclosure it's a lot of inevitable at some point. Yeah, <laughs> this is a bad step. They have to pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. I so, so I have another question because this, like, is this ranch particularly isolated? Are there roads to it? Because uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's grown um, up through the years. There's now like a neighborhood off to the side, but the ranch is still as many acres as it was back then. And just mm -hmm. recently, I think I'm able to say the name since the, the, um, the, um, show has come out it, it started airing last tuesday night it's called beyond skinwalker on history channel so oh. on june the 20th so not tomorrow night, but a week from tomorrow night the rocky mountain ranch episode will air and, and i'll be showing my first time back on the ranch proper child wow that's amazing Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And okay, we filmed so for, you know, a week and I'm anxious to see how they edited the episode because um, to my shock, um, so many things happened. So I can't wait to see that episode uh, a week from Tuesday night on History Channel. So this ranch became actually pretty well known. So these are some of the articles that came out. I'm wondering, is this the only ranch that's experiencing all this or is this is probably going on? It's just a lot of people are talking about it because people talk about like skinwalker like it's unique and clearly it's not no it's not i mean we have um bradshaw ranch in arizona and blind frog ranch out there in utah as well we have marley woods in missouri um and in the mars program for mufon which is all their pre-cms computerized cases mars team debbie ziegelmeyer and a team of 15 of us spent three over three years redacting all the personal private information out of all mufon's case files from 1969 until they went digital and we are in the process now with Bob Spearing to get these out so the public can access these files because that's what MUFON is about is to get be transparent for the public to see these reports. Um, we just had to be really careful um, in pulling out any private personal addresses and medical information, phone numbers, whatnot. Even though they're old, you still can get in trouble and kick back. So, um, but while I was going through those files, I came across another high strangest location in Ohio, Pio, Pennsylvania. There's even places around the world that report high strangeness. And so something I did was I looked at all these high strangest. Oh, and don't forget Trey Hudson's um, place down south at an undisclosed location with Trey Hudson. And, and what I love about Trey, um, and others is that we're trying to look for the commonalities between all these high strangeness locations. Um, but one thing they do have in common is they're all very, very highly 
They all ping the charts, charts as being highly, highly magnetic areas. Another thing I thought was interesting, David Pilates' new film, um, The UFO Connection, Missing uh, 411, he talks about aquifers and waters coming under these properties. So, and I wanted to see if we had any aquifers by the ranch property. And sure enough, we have upper and lower Dawson aquifers mm. that come right under the ranch property and right where the ranch sits, these two aquifers meet and they're both very, um, the water sources are pretty high um, to the surface because some of Denver's aquifers are low, low water, you know, low groundwater. These are higher. Um, so, and then we have certain rocks and minerals in these areas um, that if you do any paranormal investigating, you know, like the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park has a lot of granite and limestone. So you're looking at magnetism, granite, limestone, water, you know, are these the magical ingredients to let us interact with the phenomenon or open doors that we're not aware of gateways, doorways? I don't know, but I think it's really interesting and something that our best and bright. Yeah. Cause you know, there yeah, was a big court. wave. <laughs> there was a big wave of sightings in Topanga Canyon, which also involved some cryptozoology right. and religious miracles and mm -hmm. it's the same sort of thing. And I was looking for reasons and, there was a bunch yeah. of quartz deposits there. And I think that's interesting because Izzy Beth brings that up. Are these places where there's quartz deposits under the ground? So did you yes. ever yes, look into that? Yes, they are. The yep. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. You yes. know the magical properties of quartz crystals. Yeah. So. Ge geologically speaking, quartz and granite live together. Um, they're always found yeah. in heavy amounts together. That's, that's the way right. it is. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So this just went on and on. And here, I'm going to bring up another picture because this was, it's going to take me a second. But you had a story about like a weird metal deposit. Let me see if I yeah, can find that. so when I went to interview um, Bill Bill's um, family in Florida, she, she's the sweetest lady. She pulled a binder of um, newspaper articles that she had saved this whole time. And uh, so she allowed me to take these articles home and copy them all. And I ship, shipped the originals back to her. But in those articles was one of this mysterious blanket of metal found. And there's photographs of it right there. Um, so that is south of Rama, which is right there in Elbert County, where all these high strangest things were going on. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, somebody, <clears throat> Norad and, you know, <laughs> others, um, took this metal Um and, and they took, matter of fact, when I interviewed Bill Watts, widow, um, she said, you know, all these mutilations, um, NORAD colonel came in and confiscated all the photographs, basically told him to lie to the press and to the public um, to not report these because they were happening so often. Um, and basically told him to, to downplay it as much as he could be in the sheriff because he did not want panic and people were starting to panic. Colorado Bureau of Investigations got involved. Governor had to issue warnings because people were arm arming themselves. People were really frightened during these years. Um, like I said, they had um, no fly zones over the county, these mysterious helicopters. And, and the thing about the helicopters too, and there's articles about this, they were menacing and chasing young girls and people. Like, and I asked Richard Doty, because I'm like, why, why would, if it's the military, why are they menacing and taking these helicopters and chasing people? And there's a great publication called The Choppers and the Choppers. And there was a great investigation done about all, you know, what, how often people saw them, what, what time, day, night, months of the year, days of the week, on and on. And what Richard, to Richard told me that they did that as a diversion, as a distraction, Distraction for what? What nefarious things were they up to out there? I often wonder. I definitely you know. wonder too. I mean, because mm -hmm. there's so much going on here. Like you say, is this military or the DTs? Yeah. It's, it's if you have underground <laughs> facilities, you have to load them and you have to bring stuff in and you can bring things out. And I guarantee you, they were moving you away from whatever it is that they were doing. That's yeah. a, that's absolutely, yeah. So you talked about seeing shadow beings in your room and right. what was that do you think or could you yeah describe? you know it's interesting because i've had paranormal things happen to me you know after my father died and actually before my father died his uh his third wife edge um i believe she haunted his house and what these shadow beings were quite different than let's say your relative haunting um these were tall 
six and a half to seven foot dark shadows, often were threes. And I would see them in my doorway, standing next to my bed, next to my closet. And you could see them out of the peripheral, but they were tall and they were there. And I could just, whew, I mean, quite frightening, quite frightening for sure. Could you tell if they were know. flat, black? In other words, was it a flat image of something or did they have bulk to them? They had bulk tell? to them. I think they had mm -hmm. bulk because it was sort of like this on the outside of them, if you know what I yeah. mean. Kind of like yeah. fuzzy on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. So they were, had other people seeing, were other people seeing them as well in the house? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, my mom and sister, we would hear footsteps and other paranormal things, but they did not shadow beings like I did. So, and still to this day, I still have unusual things like that with little balls of light or, you know, things like that, especially when I went. It, here's what I took away from filming um, with history. It was like whatever's there, intelligent. It was it knew I was there. Um, so. Uh, you know, I can't talk a lot until that episode airs about things that happened, but I can tell you things happened and it, and it shocked me um, because it seemed intelligent. Did you Were ever you get any that? communication? Sorry, Dolly. <laughs> did, 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 did the, the spirits or I the can just say yes. I just say yes. There was some experiments to see if there was if I could communicate, and I, I can't give away the results, but um, they're pretty fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, I hope so you guys can tune in. <laughs> go back to when you were a little girl and you were seeing them. Then, did they ever make a move toward you? Did they ever uh, make any move toward um, making? How do I put this? I've seen shadow beings. Okay, and um, right. they will interact with you if you um mess with them long enough they will they will turn because i got sick of seeing them just watching me all the time and i was like oh no no we're not playing this anymore i'm coming after you and when it realized i was coming after it it instantly reacted to me at that point and i pissed what did it, it off do so oh oh I, I actually went outside after it because it was outside in the in the backyard and i i went after it but I don't go empty handed and it, <laughs> it was ready for it. And I came after it. I was like, if you're going to fight, if you're going to scare me, I'm going to scare you back because I'm not afraid of anything. Okay. And I was going to fix it. And it ran like hell. And then one time it actually shot a bird at me. It was so mad at me. And I'm like, I took pictures of them. Okay. And it, it's like, no, you're not going to sit here and scare me. I refuse to be scared by you. This is ridiculous. And I wish you were my friend back then, Dolly. I needed you because I, I was a shy little it. thing. <laughs> I didn't talk to anybody. I just I withdrew. Scared. I was no. really quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so a typical you... reaction with, you know. I hid under the covers. Cool. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I had a ranger uh, for a daddy, okay? He taught me stuff. So that's why I went after him. So I was kind of hoping. I think with me too, moving. though, knowing that there were cattle dying and horse dying and sheep dying and pe yeah. I mean, there was other things. So I was terrified. I was face up to anything. I don't know if I just went away because you guys are you spinning. You did for a sec. A little piece. Okay. Interestingly enough, Dr. Sprinkle, when he, you know, during our visits, he said, I'd love to put you under. So he put me under hypnosis, which was a, an interesting experiment experience in itself. Yeah. But I found it interesting from a psychological standpoint, because for the like the first 15, 20 minutes of the hypnosis, it was like that little girl was finding her voice to be able to stand up to the adults and even speak okay. about it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it was really strange because, you know, it took me like a week to even listen to the recording because I was just so uncomfortable listening to it. Um, and then there was a point where my voice changed to a little girl's voice and said, and I wasn't scared. It was all creepy. And, but it was interesting that I really did have to find my voice because I was really terrified of everything that was going on at the time. Even though we didn't know it was researched or investigated, we knew what was happening to us in the family. And we knew we weren't supposed to tell anybody. So we had this, like my sister says, you know, we had this big, heavy weighted secret that until 2013, we held with us all those years, you know, and we tried to get yeah. on with our lives, you know, get, I was married, raised my kids, did all the things you do normally, but all those questions, all those things, like what was all that? And that, you know, I started out kind of in the paranormal world, 
you know, doing ghost hunts and that I really got into watching ghost hunters and all that stuff. And then I learned about MUFON and I thought, you know, I really want to start digging on this and see, and it's just been an unbelievable journey ever since, you know, and I, I do hope we start getting disclosure, but um, I think we all have to be discerning in what's coming out right now. Um, I'm not one that trusts our, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to say it. I don't, I don't trust our government and I certainly don't trust our military um, because of things I experienced. And they had a hand in it. We yeah. know they were out there and they're keeping secrets. Mm-hmm. So why should I trust them now? Well, I'm glad you had your I sister don't. I don't. with you, you know, because a lot of people go through stuff and they're completely alone. But mm-hmm. you had your sister, you had other people there. So, yeah. and I do have some more questions, but we do need to take a very quick station break and let everyone know that you are watching The Light Gate. I'm Preston Dennett. My lovely co host is Dolly Saffron. Our amazing guest tonight is Katie Page. She's an experiencer, an author, a speaker, a television personality. She's doing all kinds of things. And we are streaming live on United Public Radio Network and UFO Paranormal Radio Network on 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM from the beautiful state of New Orleans. We're on YouTube, Rumble. Facebook, we're all over the place. So it's pretty exciting. And <laughs> I just dropped out. I'm back. <laughs> I was just abducted and brought back. <laughs> okay, yeah. Confused me there for a second. But yeah, our guest today is Katie Page. And uh, I'm really just amazed at all your experiences. So there were, you know, a number of adults there as well. Now, are, are any of these witnesses talking at all? Or my what mom's about your still sister? with us. She's yeah, my 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 well, my sister's in media, so she does traffic and news and radio coast to coast, and so she's very much interested. And she, you know, has shared her opinions and views that I share when I present. Um, but you know how media can be, so she kind of lives vicariously through me, and, and we talk about you know my discoveries and what we're finding out. My mom's ninety-one, and it depends on wow. what day you get her whether she wants to talk about it or she doesn't want to talk about it. If you get her on a good day, she'll open up about things. Sometimes she won't. So that's kind of interesting. The three other main people on the ranch have passed away. And interestingly enough, the three boys who went through more terror than I ever did, they all moved out of the state of Colorado and um, they, they just don't want anything to do with any of it anymore because it scared them so bad. Wow. That's amazing to me. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Um, yeah. I, I'm real curious about this. Your life as you've been living it. Um, how far? What's your circle of, of of where you've been living in circumference to where you were then? Are, did you leave the state? Did you move away to? What kind of experiences did you have after that? Anything? That's a really good question, Dolly. And nobody's ever asked me that in all my interviews I've ever done. So. Um, right out of high school. Um, so I lived in the house, you know, where the boys came and stayed with us right out of high school in 1988, I moved even closer to the ranch. So I was about 35 minutes away, 35, 40, give or take to the Uh ranch at that point, um, and have lived there ever since. And then just recently I moved up here, um, in the Woodland Park, Colorado Springs area. So now I'm about an hour and half away from the ranch. So I've never lived that far away. And what I find fascinating, like I said, um, it seems intelligent. Um, When I got back from filming, I had some experiences. Before I went to film, I had some experiences. While I was there, the bar um, had, and I think I can say this without getting in trouble, but the very first place we filmed The bar, this was a bar that has been in this county since the late 1800s. It's a haunted location. And the bar owner comes up to me and she goes, it's really interesting, Katie, that you were sitting right there. Because last night after the bar closed, there was a round white orb right where you're sitting. And interestingly enough, two days before that, that all of light was up here in my home, um, right here next to my head and I could see it hovering right there. And I turned and did that. So that's amazing. Very interesting. So what do you think the orb is? <laughs> I don't know. I think there's something intelligent monitoring whatever's happening. Yeah. I, I can do. tell you a private thing. My experience with the ETs. Okay. Um, we don't 
nobody's off the board as far as they're considered. They watch everybody. Okay. Yeah. And, right. and, and they will single out those of you who are experiencing things that are upsetting, conflicting, and it has to do with how you're being treated by certain entities on this planet. Okay. In other words, it puts you in a different arena when you're in that circumference. A lot of, you know, people ask the question, why are military people so uh, experienced? So many of them ask yourself, really try to figure it out from this angle. Um, we're living in a world in the military where we're under uh, all kinds of orders. We have to live a certain way. Uh, a lot of us uh, have things happen to us that are not quite what you would want to have happen to you, especially on the outside, might not be looked at great. We've had very extensive, tough lives to live. And ET does watch over them, okay? And they keep up with you. And uh, so I just want to- I have noticed that. Uh, I ha yeah, I have noticed that a lot of experiencers have military connections in their family, yes. if not themselves, a grandparent, a father, a mother. Yeah. Um, and I find that fascinating as if, as if ET is saying, why are, why are humans warring? Why do they want weapons of mass destruction? And they're taking a hard look at not only those in, men and women in the military, uh, based companies, um, their families as well. Yes, absolutely. It's it's yeah. hard yeah. Uh, when you're an uh, an evolved race of beings, and uh, you're watching a, a place like us, and we're supposed to be evolving, and then you see things not going exactly well, even after you've tried to you know give hints and show them things and everything, and it still go the wrong way. It's real disconcerting to them. It really is. And right, right. Uh, and should I mention well. here? Yeah. I in here too that I learned that my grandfather in Wisconsin, they had a home in Lake Geneva. He was in the Navy and he had a sighting of an oblong shaped craft over Lake Como in Wisconsin. And that was investigated by J. Allen Hynek. Um, and that oh, was yeah. in the early sixties. Yeah. And my dad was Navy as well. Yeah. Yeah. My father had his first experience in Wisconsin, it, almost right near there. And I'm not kidding you, but this was way back in the forties. So I think we I think we talked about that in San Francisco. Yes. We kind of had the yes. Illinois group and the Wisconsin yes. group with with yes. Dolly yes. and Paul Hynek and yeah. and Mary and myself and yeah. yeah. So all right. Well, I want to go back just a second to shadow people because we got a question from Gray Troll, and he's wondering what are shadow people. He's asking Dolly, but I'm curious on your opinion because we Dolly and I did a show on that on another podcast, and we kind of dug deep and. Couldn't really figure out for sure, but we're thinking they're lower dimensional entities. Right. Um, it, I have a real serious uh, theory about this, okay? And I'm going to say theory because I can't prove myself right or wrong, okay? But I'm, from my, from my knowledge base, I, I think I'm real close to this. We have 12 dimensions in this universe, okay? We're sitting in the third. Everything in the first and the second are just below us. And we can see them because we look down and we see flat planes, we see, you know, two-dimensional planes. And just because our consciousness is operating here doesn't mean a consciousness can't operate in the first or second dimension. And I think that these beings are entity consciousness that are operating that way, and they're coming up as one and two-dimensional sites. That's why I purposefully asked you, did they have bulk, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think the closer they get to the third dimension, they look like they have bulk, and I've experienced that as well. But I'm pretty sure that there are entities living in those dimensions. I'm not kidding. And that's what we're seeing. So. So interesting. Yeah. My friend Heidi Hollis um, has done extensive work on the figure. So I would recommend to your listeners to look up the name Heidi Hollis and try to find any of her podcasts or her books out there. Um, and, and she's done so much work on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, know I know that a lot of people all. believe they're demonic and stuff like that, you know, which... I can't say. I don't know. Uh oh. Heidi. Oh no. <laughs> Katie is fading out again. Well, she'll be in in a sec. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Santana Barish, which I find interesting, which says, "I heard Mufon is cracking down on paranormal research. Do you know why?" 
Um, I do. Oh, you're there. Um, and and I am. I'm here. I'm come. I'm fading in and out through the dimensions. <laughs> um, no, I apologize. I I need to get this fixed before I I do anything. But um, yes, I do. Um, when this was happening, uh, Mufon was working with Congress and going through some things. And I think with the UA UAP task force, um, they kind of wanted to get away from the woo as much as they could. Um, they're kind of lightening up on that stance a little bit because as they know through high strangeness cases and even, you know, they have their guests, um, their keynote speaker at the symposium in Cincinnati, which is in August this year. If you're interested, go to MUFON.com and look at their symposium. I'll be out there as well. Um, but they have David Pilates now as their keynote. So they're kind of backpedaling on that a little bit because they got, they got a lot of kickback from a lot of us that were like, wait a minute, we know this yeah. stuff's connected yeah. and it is connected That's in so many places. Say. So yeah. yeah. Most contactees experience the full range of paranormal, yes. but I get yeah, it sure. because this is, we're still at a point. I mean, it's definitely more back in the day where it's a lot to swallow. If you're already talking about UFOs and then you bring in levitation and telepathy and all the paranormal studies, yeah, all that stuff. Astro yeah. traveling. <laughs> That's the topic I really got interested in is this um interesting topic and study of dissociation, people who have near death experiences and trauma that experience a lot of um paranormal UFO activity. Absolutely noticed that connection. Yeah, that's pretty well established yeah. in the paranormal field. Yeah. Okay, but I have another slide I want to bring up <laughs> because I am curious about the, the whole Bigfoot thing. We haven't really dived deep into that because, as I recall, you know, when I wrote about your case, I, which was really just a half page in my book, UFOs mm -hmm. Over Colorado, there was this, you know, this is from Timothy Good. Maybe you can verify this or not, but there was an incident where a UFO landed. And there was grays walking around and there was a Bigfoot and they were kind of ordering it around and lots of Bigfoot coming back and forth. So what is going on here? So, <laughs> so that, that is one thing. And if my sister's listening, forgive me, forgive me, my sister. But she went to the high school prom with the oldest boy out there in that small town. After prom, she goes to the ranch. Still terrifies her to this day. I think something happened to her, but she will matter of factly tell you that in her opinion, and there's others that have written about this, Stan Gordon wrote an excellent book um, on this. Um, uh, it's called, Stan Gordon's book is called Silent, Bigfoot. yeah, the, the Bigfoot, Silent Invasion. Yeah, and um, she will say that the Bigfoot were definitely connected to the craft and they were like workers or bodyguards of some sort. And that's coming from Monster. And the case out there, and that letter that you just had up there, Preston, uh, when I, I don't remember what conferences was, but this was an email I got from Bob Solace. And he was talking about in, in the same time around 1977 out at Melmstrom in Montana, um, they were giving air men and women lie detector tests um, that were encountering UFOs and Sasquatch. And there was the, the drawing you see on the left was a recreation of a drawing from somebody in Montana in 1977 that passed the polygraph test at Melmstrom. That's the Bigfoot they saw. And the one on the right was the one directly out of Dr. Leo Sprinkles files from the ranch in Elbert County. And I don't know about you, but they look very similar. And when yeah. I was young, my mom would refer to them as white fuzzies because they had gray hair, not this hmm. more, um, not so dense, not like your typical Bigfoot Sasquatch, but, um, you know, a different type of nose, almost a more human type of eye. And then just recently, I'm like, it's not so far fetched to say that these beings, these Sasquatch that are seen are directly connected to the craft. And in fact, could be an ET race in and of themselves. Why couldn't there be a race of Sasquatch beings that are an ET race? Yeah, I've, I've looked into this, the whole UFO Bigfoot connection, because I had my own case. And then I got yeah. another and I started looking I'm like, well, there's quite a few of these. And of course, a bunch yeah, in Pennsylvania. Right. And I'm like, e right. are, are they ETs? But they're, they've been on our planet for a very long time. They're still right. here. And I think I'm wondering, because I think some of these are sentient, right? Yeah, um, they could be. Intelligent. I'm wondering if some of these Bigfoot are just dead up contactees themselves. You know, could kind be. of like. Or, <laughs> you know or is it part of the, I mean part of and i i don't know if david pilates 
really accuses Sasquatch or Bigfoot as taking some of these missing people. But, you know, have they done that in the past? I don't know. Yeah, well, it's an interesting aspect to the yeah. whole yeah. thing here. Because, so wh why do you, th I mean, we already kind of went into this, but all of this phenomena is occurring at once in one, these specific locations. So I'm just curious as to why that would be. Well, um, let's look at military bases close by and all those other things. So again, it's chicken or the egg, you know, going on. So I don't know. Another interesting uh, phenomenon that occurred out there. And again, I don't know if I sent you these slides or not, Preston, but it were the two A7Ds that crashed. In the report, it said that two A7Ds crashed in pursuit of a UFO at night. Um, and so I'm like, well, certainly if that happened, there has to be some documentation on it. And so I sent a FOIA request to Kirkland Air Force Base and got a nice big thick packet back on that crash. And um, both pilots ejected, both pilots survived. But was what was interesting is they're flying over residential neighbors or neighborhoods at night out there in Elbert County. They have 255 live rounds of ammunition on board. There it is. That was in the document right there. Um, you know, that uh, two National Guard interceptors went up up and then Iraq dacted out and went down while in pursuit of a UFO at night. And this made the sheriff a little um, unnerved. So we stopped looking into it. In the documents I received back, it said one of the causes, and there were several listed, was that the instructor, so supposedly, supposedly it was an instructor and a um, student pilot up there flying around with live ammunition, which seems silly to me. But um, that the the instructor pilot misidentified the rotating beacon of another aircraft and it never mentions anywhere in the transcripts anywhere else what the other aircraft was it doesn't identify it doesn't say it was a Cessna and nothing else and then I went to David Marler's and was doing some research came across a NORAD um, document it was several pages long where the Air Force actually admits scrambling two interceptors in pursuit of a UFO that came up on radar out of NORAD in Canada. And, and this was on the front page of the National Enquirer. And in good old David Marler style, he's like, oh, I think I have that. Went right to the file and pulled it out, and there it was. So we know yeah. that the Air Force was doing that, scrambling jets with, un, um, you know, with something unidentified on radar. So why wouldn't they do it in this case out in Elbert County? I'm sure that they did. And in this case, the teachers crashed, and they lost both both inter interceptors and mm -hmm. both pilots survived. So I really need to try and find these pilots, see if they're still alive. That would be a good idea. That would be a really good yeah. idea. What the are you chasing? Come on. on. Deathbed confession. Was that the craft, <laughs> if they got too close to a UFO or the UFO got too close to them, it would have knocked their power out. And if they were ejecting, that would have been number it's one true. right there. Yeah. If, you're, if your whole jet goes dead, you're out of it. you got to get out. And two, uh, they can move from Alaska all the way across the country, you know, in less than three minutes, they can move that fast. And if they were scrambling, you're probably wondering what the hell it was doing, you know, where it was going and they wanted to track it. And you have to look at the, the, uh, the reports of every single base from Alaska all the way down to where it was to see how many other bases were scrambling. Also, that's a really good thing to do. Back yourself up with that. L look at its flight path, where it was really coming from. You, you do that and you get some really big pictures showing up in your mind. Like, hmm. That's you know? right. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's from Santana Barish. Thank you, Santana. Yeah. Okay, I have another slide yeah, I, want to... <laughs> I want to. I have another slide I want to bring up. And uh, so these are some of the ETs that were at the ranch. Now this to me, for me, this is the most mind blowing part of my whole journey so far. So at the time, I'm just a few years into researching and the ET on the right that you see these tubes and this like, um, it almost had like a clear helmet over the top. This was in Dr. Sprinkle's files as the ETs being on the ranch. The one on the left, <laughs> I, at the time, was um, Colorado MUFON's guest speaker coordinator, and I invited this gentleman named Sean Bartok, who wrote a book called Flashbacks. And his property was said to be in Castle Rock, Colorado, 
Come to find out the actual location of the property is a mere 14 miles away from our ranch property. He, well, I'm sitting in the th third row watching his presentation. I've never put that drawing out in the public domain ever. I wanted to see if I could find anything like it. And he said those tubes in this guy's neck would come out just like the guy on our ranch. I don't know about you guys, but they look awful similar. Same size eyes, heavy brow, wrinkles on the forehead, wrinkles around the mouth, and these weird tubes. And then his next photo, I don't know if I sent you another photo, but of, of Sean's drawing where the tubes came out from the guy's neck. And it looks very similar to the one seen at Elbert County. The other type of being seen in Elbert County were Nordics, these blonde, blue-eyed Nordics. And in the reports, they said they were in conflict with one another. I'm thinking that Tubi guy, I call him the Tubi guy, the Tubi guy looks like um, tip maybe an AI type of ET. And the other one, the Nordics, of course, are not. They're, they're you know, your blonde, tall, blue on, blue eyed, blonde creatures. And they were in conflict with one another. In other words, don't mind us. You guys are just in our way. We're here doing whatever they're doing. I don't know what. Um, and that's kind of what was reported out there. So I find that interesting. Well, so there's all different types of ETs. Cause I remember hearing about yeah. the, the uh, human looking ones and the guy who came up there thought at first that they might be government people, <laughs> which makes these, you wonder. These ones though with the tubes, they have these spindly, like almost, almost insect looking arms and legs. They're like, that big around you know that's yeah, how they were depicted yeah the like AI a shield over their chest weighted up. they're just they're like, sticks, a body with yeah. you know arms and legs and sticks. long necks yeah and there you, you go yeah look at that up. yeah and you don't know how they're holding their head up you you go right hmm. You know? Right. And I saw these drawings at Popular Mechanics when I was standing in line at the grocery store and I'm looking at these. I'm like, oh, my gosh, are they like an A.I.? Now, the the drawing there on the right where it's um, uh, that's the one from Sean Bartok that he saw those in the window outside. And that's those tubes in the neck came out like that, just like the guy at our property. And, and to me, I was mind blown by that because we didn't know of each other. We didn't know each other's stories. He had the same circles on the ground, the same hum sounds, almost identical type of activity from his property 14 miles away to our property there. So, and we didn't know of each other. And to meet each other, and we still communicate to this day, was like, holy smokes, like you can't make that beep up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know? well, what's interesting to me is because Dolly certainly talked about the little AI grays, as have many people, Whitley Strieber certainly. But yeah, to, right. just today, you know, on the congressional hearings with Stephen Greer, he's talking about how we ourselves have made these robotic type creatures, which I always kind of discounted. But now seeing some of those human looking robots, which are introducing themselves and talking to people and look very real i'm yeah. getting to wonder <laughs> right, right. You know, this is and then we have to wonder water. what's coming down what's coming down the pike i i'm just been just recently turned on to you know i kind of bury my head in my own research and i i don't pay attention to as many things as i should out there but i just recently came across john ramirez testimonies and that and you know he talks about things um coming down the pike here in 2027 and that there may be intervent ET intervention coming. And I'm like, what's that about? Why, why what's happening? So yeah, this is a whole other thing I need to look into. Do you guys know much about that? Yes, I do. I'll oh, tell you. Do? I'll tell me, that. tell me, tell me. Uh, the gist of it is this, is that um, earth is, has cycles, you know, our sun has cycles where we are placed in the, in our galaxy, you know, as we travel around, we go through different energy fields and things like that. And there's a giant electromagnetic current uh, sheet that is sluicing through. It's every 12,000 years we hit this thing and we're going through it right now. And that's where our sun changed. That's polarity. what's happening to our internet right now. It's the yes, uh, solar flares. Well, and basically stuff. it's a lot of stories. It's, it's not the, it's not the current sheet that's doing, although it can affect us in certain ways, but, um, as our poles are changing, our sun, you know, is able to put more uh, energy at us because our magnetosphere is not a 100%. It's like it's down 40% just about at this moment. 
And uh, so when our son has a CME, a coronal mass ejection, which it does do, uh, it can hit us harder than you can imagine. And they have proof of that. 1859, the Carrington event is one of the first ones recorded ever. And uh, it took all the uh, wires out and the telegraphs out worldwide. And it was a new technology coming up. And if it can do that then, and it wasn't even as bad then as what we have going on right now. Right. And we're, we're looking at a possible downing of our grid from this effect. We're gotcha. in solar maximum right now. The magnetosphere is really vulnerable. And if it pops one off in the X-class range, it can knock us out. And then we right. have other things coming right behind that. They're just Which would explain like, why people are getting issued these special phones, right? Exactly. So they can communicate. Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. And so get water and food, people. And also, <laughs> I had another question for you. I was, I was, you know, I, I it was James Keenan, I believe, when we we're I was talking to James about um, these cycles, and he's seeing cycles too, where where the activity at these high strangest locations, not just Elbert County, but Skinwalker, they come where they kind of ebb and flow, and we're in a high cycle right now. So if you want right. to get out there and investigate these high strangest places, now the time is to do it because our right. magnetic fields are really high and these are already highly magnetic places. And so right. now you're adding to that and right. now you're going to have extra stuff. Well, you know, yeah. we're in a circuit with our sun. And what that means literally is whatever our sun sends us energetically, we absorb it and send it back. And when right. you see lots of lightning, especially ground to ceiling lightning, that's a huge circuit effect of what the sun is throwing at wow. us, usually coronal hole streams that are causing that, the coronal winds. Um, we're in a situation where everything the sun's shooting at us, we're popping back. And that means we're heating up. Our mag our uh, mantle is starting to loosen up. We're having more volcanoes, you know, more flooding, right. everything. It's a big mess. It's messing with our yeah. planet. And well, that's, that's scary. So crazy. I worry <laughs> about Yellowstone here in Colorado. So I hope that stays calm. But Christopher... Yeah. Um, Christopher asked yeah. that question, what was my most strange, strangeness experience on the ranch? And Christopher, I'd have to say that we heard the hum and then the power goes out and that crazy yeah. electronic voice warning us. When I got yeah. home that night, I walked into her house, I my floor and I was for a while. I was trying to with you, what did you eat? I was trying to say peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and I couldn't. Um, that was the first night in my first full blown migraine headache where I was vomiting that whole thing. Ooh. I suffered those until I finally went through biofeedback training. Um, that was kind of the start of it all. After that night on that ranch, bright light out the window, all that, that was when it started for me. That's when the shadow started. That's when all of it started. Um, wow. so I would say that definitely was the most terrifying, most significant night on that ranch property for sure. And to see that in the briefing document was, again, this unbelievable validation, not only for me, but my sister and my mom as well. It was like, holy cow, there it is on, in black and white. Like that happened. That actually happened. And there it is. And, and, and that was just incredible. Did you ever see the grays yourself on, on the ranch or did otherwise? I, did I ever see what? The grays or any ETs? I mean, I know you saw I don't Shadow recall. People. Yeah, I don't ever recall seeing ETs of any kind, and I don't have any, like, I can't, I don't consider myself an abductee. I might consider myself, like, an experiencer or a contactee if you want to make a difference, because I have dreams about things. Like, they come to me in dream states, like weird memories. Things came through in my hypnosis, under hypnosis, that kind of surprised me about seeing things out of a window and all these things. But um, I don't, like, if I don't, it's not like I remember seeing E.T. like I see my next door neighbor, if that makes any sense. Um, right. But I have dreams about them. Whatever that's worth. I don't well, I don't know what I that means. <laughs> I'm sure you know. That's one of the signs I'm in denial. Signs. I'm just in denial, probably. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> Did you see it's Bigfoot at all? I did not see Bigfoot either. I did not see Bigfoot, but um, here recently we purchased um, acreage up in Bailey, Colorado. Um, yeah. We had eight acres up in Bailey. I had a little cabin up there, and it's really close to Jim Mars Bigfoot Museum, Sasquatch Outpost there up in Bailey. If you're ever in Colorado, go check it out. It's great. Um, and um, But I just had a weird, like, 
thing with a, a, a it was a huge like almost like branch or tree breaking in front of the ranch house it was dusk we had just put in a big water feature we put in a seven foot water fountain so i don't know if something was to see the water feature but it was the worst smell i've ever smelled in my life it smelled literally like a dead body and the smell traveled on our property. So, and it was getting dark. I was scared. I went into the house, waited for my husband at the time and my daughter to get there. Um, the next day we went like looking for prints or hair or anything. Cause that was the worst smell I've ever smelled. It wasn't hair or anything. I just had a bear visiting up here. Just a few weeks. Um, high five bear anyway. And, um, <laughs> we call him high five bear anyway. Um, but, uh, we, the, the, the dirt was too dry to leave any prints. We didn't find any evidence, but I think that was probably a Sasquatch encounter. I don't know. I've never smelt anything like it before or after. And that weird tree knock was quite interesting. And there's a lot of Bigfoot sighted in the Bailey area. So who knows? Yeah, well, I've been in Colorado. I think it's probably the most beautiful state of, I've oh, been in thanks. every state except Maine. <laughs> <laughs> I just adore Colorado, except for the winters. I'm, I'm not going to do it because of that. <laughs> My sister lives there in Mancus. Uh, and she uh, loves it. I love the so. <laughs> yeah, I love the trees. I came home with some of the uh, pine cones, and I'm rooting. I'm getting them to sprout right now, and I want to see if I can get them to grow here where I live. And I might not be successful, but I'm I'm trying because I love the trees. It's beautiful there. So or in New Orleans, is that right? No, I'm 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 actually up in Georgia. In, uh, oh, you're in Georgia. In okay. Yes. Yep. All right. This is a question which is actually coming towards us, Dolly. But maybe okay. you have your opinions on it too, Katie. And this is from Sly Martins. Important question. Where do ETs fit into the consciousness spectrum? For example, from the material realm all the way to source consciousness. How do they see themselves? Thanks from Portugal. Ooh, Portugal, very cool. Hi, Portugal. Well, wow. <laughs> I will just answer my opinion on this real quick. Um, I think it's both. I think they are actually material. I think they're people like us and that they do are connected to source. People say, oh, you know, our ET is interdimensional. Well, yes, we're all interdimensional. This is just my opinion based on my own research and experiences. Right. And you can call them time travelers because, yes, they've done that. I don't think they're us from the future or anything, but there's no doubt they're physical and that they are appearing on radar. They've been photographed. People are disappearing from their homes. I mean, there's implant evidence. There's healings. There's no doubt this is a physical experience. But, yeah, it's also deeply spiritual as well. So it's a difficult question to answer. But that's my short answer. <laughs> My answer would be that I was, I've was i been brought up uh, not only by my family, but by ETs as well. And one of the things that I was taught as I was growing up is that we are all consciousness together in source, all of us throughout the universe, and that we are born over and over and over again. The body is just a vehicle to live in, to experience and learn and grow. And uh, we've all lived all over this universe, all of us. You. you Earth isn't the only destination. And when you pass from here, you might be born somewhere else in the universe and live that life and then come back again. Uh, the reason that humans don't uh, are not aware of this is that they're not aware of uh, a lot of things because they're not fully using their psychic abilities. And one of the things ET is hoping that they do is do that to develop your ability so that you can regain what you're not getting from the disconnect. And uh, so, yeah, that's my answer. Well, you think, I agree with both of you. I agree with both of you. Well said, well said. <laughs> I can't add to that. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So, oh my gosh, there's just so much going on. You said you had precognition or um, psychic stuff. Is that dreams? Was that well, all part funny. of it? Yeah, and Dolly maybe can and help me relate to that. But when you're like, I thought, when you are a certain way, you think everybody's that way. So I thought yes. everybody saw people's lives in pictures or movies. Right. Exactly. Like, so anytime, yep. I, anytime I meet somebody, I see a little movie of them and where they live and how they are. And I thought everybody exactly. did this. Um, I live 
unplug that a lot because I've had some really intense, you know, people, uh, my good friend who had a daughter pass and, and some mm -hmm. things like that. So I think it's, I think people who do psychic work, I give them a lot of props because I think they take a lot on, they take a lot of people's energy on. And I think all of us have the abilities to be psychic. If we, it's like a muscle, you exercise it, you train, right. you learn. Um, exactly. And I like to unplug mine a lot because for me it's, you know, I don't know, maybe it's my ADHD tendency. I already take, I already, always, always feel like this anyway. So I'm like, nope, <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, it's a lot. And I've sort of always been, had, had that kind yeah. of intuitive psychic kind of stuff going on. But like well, I said, I think all, of, all, of us do, yeah. all of us do. And yeah. it's just a matter of being in tune and in touch with it. Yeah. We all hear each other throughout the entire planet. You know, a lot of people right. think the planet itself is conscious. It's not. It's all of us. And we hear right. each other thinking and flows of our thoughts and it, the energy of it flows throughout this entire globe. Right. And uh, it, it amazes me. And it's like with all that psychic energy, even without knowing it is going on, why more people don't really try to tap into it. And the ability right. that you're talking about is you are a tapper. You can see the person for who they really are and you, you get information yeah. from it. That's, that's well, the first that, role of psychic ability right there. So, right. Exactly. It's that uneasy feeling you get and you should pay attention to it every absolutely. time, every you time you feel uneasy about something. Away. Listen, <laughs> because you know, because everybody has that ability when something exactly. doesn't feel right. Yep. People want to ignore it. Please don't, because you're often right. And it's that entanglement, right? I mean, it's yes. that it is entanglement, distance, exactly. or we can be entanglement. So right. yeah, we all have that. We're all entangled with all of us, with one another. And it's just a matter of really paying attention to that. And, and raising, I'm, a, I'm definitely a believer of somebody who's gone through some traumatic, scary things in their lives. I've definitely have been you know, in low places in my life. And, and a lot of experiencers and Dolly knows will isolate themselves. They'll feel different. They'll deal with depression. They'll deal with all that thing. I'm not immune to that. And, but I also know when you're resonating low like that, you can allow a lot of things in and it just sort of spirals and cycles. And you have right. to really do the work to pull yourself out of that and work to, to become, you know, higher, vibrational positive yeah. you gotta work yeah. at that i, I have to work on it every day to to stop yeah. that na, 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 negative negative talk that we all beat ourselves up over all the time so you know like everybody that's something we can work on yeah. well here's a question from izzy beth and i don't want to get too into it because it's kind of off topic yeah. but we got to answer questions from our peeps <laughs> and izzy and beth is peeps. asking dolly <laughs> what is causing our magnetosphere to be lowering like it is. It's just a natural cycle, right, Dolly? No. It, it, well, it's a cycle that happens when our pole, the polarity of our planet changes. And I'm going to try to show you something. Here's a, it's my mouse that I risked my thing on, but here's our planet, okay? And we have a pole here and we have a pole somewhere down here. The poles are starting to move because electromagnetically, the poles are switching their polarity with one another. And as this pole is going this way and going down, the other one is probably going in the opposite direction. Now, magnetism, you know, we know that it comes out and goes around on, from the poles. And you see these uh, electric field lines that come up from down and above. And they're very stable when your poles are stable. But the minute the poles start excursioning and moving to change polarity, these lines go and they go crazy. And you, it's nuts. It literally is nuts. And it causes all kinds of problems for us on this planet. One of them is uh, SpaceX had a problem shooting some satellites up. We had a chronomass ejection coming at us and our, the polarity was bad and they blew up just after they took off. It wasn't our fault that it happened. It was our magnetism that caused that to happen. Uh, Airplanes experience it. Uh, one of the things that's happening globally, and I've watched this my whole life because I like to fly, is that all the GPS tracking, all the ALS tracking on all the airports, you know, it's how planes find the airport or line up with it as they're coming in, have had to move majorly, like 38 degrees now, almost 40. And over the years, it's like, oh, here we go again. And everybody's got to recalibrate their airport ALS systems, GPS, as you would know them, to keep the planes from crashing into one another or, you know, having problems. 
Uh, we'll have to take a deeper dive on that one of these days. Yeah, no, that's it's interesting. <laughs> if you want to know when it's happening to us and you around where you are, you have a phone that has, a, you know, you can go to the thing and you can put an address and you can find it. You've got GPS and it's tracking you and showing you where to go. If it goes out and dies and it won't come back up, that's a bad day. Energetically, we're having something happen to us and the the polarity lines have lost their minds. So wow. that's what that is. Okay. Well, here's another interesting question, which I think brings up an, I've got an opinion about this one, actually. I wonder if you do, Katie, and I'm sure you do, Dolly. Um, Donnie's Happy Hour asks, do you feel the government is admitting to UAPs, which they are, so they can fly the crafts they have in broad daylight? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like what you're oh, <laughs> I mean, They're, they're, they're okay. saying they're real. And, I'm, and I think this is a good point because perhaps this is all the buzz about this false flag and the fake ET invasion. Maybe this is their... There's an element of propaganda to this whole disclosure process, which is clearly yeah. tightly controlled. Right. Uh, it hasn't been any disclosure. These are whistleblowers. Yeah. This is not our government. Yeah, it's saying not the government anything. saying anything. It is a whistleblower. <laughs> Point, set, match, right there. If, right. Unless the government admits it, it's not happening. A whistleblower is not the government, and they will never admit. You have never heard them admit. They will never admit. Um, the only day you will hear them come to the podium and say, this is real, it's happening, is when they can call it a national security event or worldwide security event. Then you know the false flag is in operation because they're planning on trying to make you think that ET is no good and that they're going to get us. So until I mean. until ET comes and intervenes, like they're said to, we won't. No, I think uh, our government needs to keep our secrets for obvious reasons, and they're not going to go flying oh, these things God. around in the daytime because they right. don't want to expose our secrets and our technologies to other countries. So, no. so are there? Here's a uh, just a comment from Christopher Harmon. Thanks, <laughs> Katie. Anyone and everyone can and will experience something on the ranch. It seems. So is, are people still going there and still experiencing stuff? Well, that's what, you know, you'll, you'll be able to watch on, on Tuesday the 20th <laughs> when I got to meet the family for the first time. And I could tell your listeners this, just like behind the scenes, that was legit. They would not talk with the people that live there now, meet them until cameras were rolling. So everything you see in that episode, e even when it comes down to are going to make appearances and, and tests they did, as 100% legit, that was my first time meeting these people, the first time hearing the history, the first time me learning things they've experienced. And I can just tell you this, with people and locals that I've talked to during the filming, stuff's still going on, and I couldn't believe everything we experienced. And that, to me, I, that that's what I took away from revisiting the ranch, was like, holy cow, I thought this stuff was over, and it's certainly not. Wow. Yeah. Chad is just buzzing about it. Charlene saying, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing oh, your experiences you. and growing to such a it's lovely so woman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank <I'm>, you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. So, so this, yeah. ta this takes quite a bit of courage to come forth and share these experiences. And I think that's people don't understand. Like it's taken me a long time to even get through writing this book and researching because it's such a personal experience for, for me and my sister as well. Um, that it's like you learn something and then you have to process and work through it personally. Then you learn some more. And then, so it's like this whole kind of, it's taken a long time. It's not like I'm an outsider just researching something that didn't affect me emotionally, you know, and so it does take a toll and it takes me some like every now and again, I have to take like what I call a UFO break because <laughs> it gets too much. Right? Sometimes <laughs> it really does. It really does. You know. Well, I want to I want to ask you very much to say again what night this is coming on and what time. Yeah, so on uh, History Channel's Beyond Skinwalker, which comes on right after um, the Skinwalker Ranch episode. The Colorado Ranch episode will air on June the 20th. So not this Tuesday, not tomorrow night, but a week from tomorrow night. Um, okay. So I, like all of you, I'm going to be, I haven't seen it. I don't know how they yeah, edited it. So and I'm super excited to watch it and see what made the I show. I know, I am too, actually. Yeah, and I didn't yeah. quite catch it because you blurked up a little bit. Is it June the 28th? 
No, June the twentieth. So not 20th. this Tuesday, but a week from the week from Tuesday, a week from okay. tomorrow. We will be on yeah. the living room couch watching this. Right, okay? and I think for oh, yeah, Mountain we... Standard Time, it's seven o'clock. But you'll have to just look at you for your local time. It's Beyond Skinwalker okay. on History just... Channel. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very you. cool. Well, we have just about 15 minutes left. So if there's anything we haven't talked about, definitely now would be the time to bring it up. But here is a question off topic again a little bit, but still interesting from Santana Barish. Do any of you know about the Bermuda Triangle? Well, I've certainly read the books on it and know about the very famous cases. I think there's something to it. Um, Magnetic I again. I think there's some magnetic right, exactly. with it. Definitely. Alaskan Triangle right. as well. That's another great show, The Alaskan Triangle, with my friend Mike Rexecker and show. Jeremy yeah. Ray are on that show. Um, again, I think these are all highly magnetic areas, and they mess with the, like Dolly was saying, the aircraft um, navigation system. So, right. yeah, 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 absolutely interesting. Uh -huh. I, know. I, I know it messes with compasses as well. I mean, it can make a compass spin wildly for no reason whatsoever. You know, it's there's well, a it lovely is, Dr. Sprinkle. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to bring yes. up Dr. Sprinkle again because he's so great and you got to meet him. So, what was he like? And, you know, this how man, he... this man, the way I describe him, he is a man who I like to say is generous with his time and spirit. He is the type of person who will take the time, he is not rushed, he will invite you to sit on his couch. And you, he will talk with you for an hour or two and he will listen to you and pull things out of his drawer and share with you and, Hey, borrow this book and teach you and channel. He channeled. Um, and so he would get into this meditative state and he would channel. Oh, he actually did a channel. No, he did a channel for my daughter. Cause my daughter came with me on one of my trips up there for the weekend wow. and he channeled my daughter and gave her great advice. Um, and oh, he's he, a contactee he, as well. I mean, didn't he? He ever... was. He, he in Boulder, Colorado. He was in college, um, studying to be a psychologist, and had um, his uh, his uh, UFO experience. He calls it, um, which made yeah. him a scoffer to a believer. And and he was just endearing. He had a great sense of humor, and he would he would always go yeehaw, you know, like, yeehaw. <laughs> um, just 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 a delightful, caring person. And, and, and for me, I guess I, why I, I can't speak highly enough of him because, um, going through what we, we did, I did, my sister did on the ranch to have somebody finally sit down a, and knew about it. Cause he was one of the researchers out there along with, by the way, there was a woman, she was a psychic medium. Um, her name was Clarissa Bernhardt. And there were documents and letters um, from her. And I checked her down. She lives in Canada now. And I did an interview with her as well. She was one of the only psychics to accurately predict to the minute and to the date of, um, to predict an earthquake. Um, but um, yeah, just wow. fascinating. But Leo, Dr. Leo, to have that validation to finally somebody was willing to listen and, and, and to help me through that process of discovery you know, he, we, we lost a gem of a man when, when Leo passed. So I, you know, I always like, I'm glad you brought him up Preston because he, you know, I think he was really known in Western in this kind of vicinity of the United States, you know, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Texas, Oklahoma, all that, but not so much out East. Um, and, uh, he, um, he did a lot of work. He uh, also was into near death experiences and he was one of the investigators with Snippy the horse, one of our first mutilations. So out yeah, in Alamosa, Colorado as well. There yeah. weren't a lot of yeah, actual yeah. academic scientists looking into it at that right, time. Right. You know, there was right. James McDonald, Jalen Hynek and Leo Sprinkle. I think that's about it for yeah. public. <laughs> right. And it was so cool reading all those letters. And like I said, anybody can go down there to Laramie and pull those boxes. That is a photograph there of, you know, I would just go down there for two, two, three days at a time and pull box after box, open every file. And I would just take pictures. So you could take pictures on your cell phone. Then I'd go home and read the letters, organize them into files, and then pick like the best ones um, wow. to put in these chapters. Uh, well, an and and I was so together. happy. Yeah, I was happy I finished it before Leo passed because, um, yeah, Katie Grabowski, it says on there that that's my name before I changed it. Um, yeah. But anyway, should update that graphic. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, well, that's, anyway, that's but yeah, he was a, he was a gen, genuine man. He was just great. 
All right. The book is called Letters of Love and Light for anyone who wants to check it out. It's a fascinating glimpse into Leo Sprinkle and Katie. That's just so cool that you got to meet him and experience all that. And this is bound to come up. I'm going to bring up this question because it's going viral. I'm sure you've heard about it, Katie, <laughs> the Las I Vegas have. incident. And I have my opinions about it. I'm, I don't know. Well, I'm, I haven't investigated the case. I saw an interview with the kid, one of the witnesses. I heard the police. I saw the footage of what looks like to me a meteor coming down. I am not right. going to really comment on it because I haven't investigated it. I'm watching it. And I'll, we'll see how it rolls out. But I wonder if that's exactly what I was going to say. I know within <laughs> MUFON, we have Mark D'Antonio who kind of analyzed some of it. And again, there was, we know there was a meteor that came down, which could explain the the green lights. Um, so I don't know. I haven't investigated it either too closely. So the jury's out on that one. <laughs> any, any, <laughs> you Dolly, you want to chime in? No, <laughs> no, no. I'll let, I'll let you guys investigate it. I'm not there to do it. I have opinions and I'll just keep them to myself. <laughs> I my okay. So when is your book about the Colorado ranch coming out? Or is that, do you have a due date? My goal. Yeah. My, my goal is five or six months. I just, yeah, I have a lot going on right now. So I'm going to hit, hit, hit the ground running. And as fate would have it, I'm actually glad that it was postponed because now I can include all those things that happened during the filming. So um, yeah, five or six months is my goal. Well, I'm definitely excited to see how the show goes. Cause you know, I've done TV a number of times and sometimes I'm like, well, I interviewed them for two days and I got, two minutes <laughs> right happened? right that's what that's what i'm curious about too <laughs> it was like cutting room and floor I've, oh. and I've had a few shows that i wasn't happy with i mean they sometimes twist your words around so we'll yeah. see i'm excited right. about it because this subject yeah, at the end of the day at the end of the day preston i i agree with you like i think it's important to get out there and speak about our experiences but and you know with these shows it's entertainment and they're going to mold it to shape whatever narrative and whatever form of entertainment they want. And I've had that happen just a little bit where you're like, well, I didn't really say it like that. Exactly. <laughs> and and I get exactly. it. Like, yeah. yeah, I get it. That they're going to do that. So you hope for the best. <laughs> Did you really say that? <laughs> no. I said this over here there, and then they spliced it together and they got that. <laughs> Right. That's exactly, exactly oh. what happened to me. Yeah, on a show. Right, right. Right. That's right. They were asking Gosh, me, how, how common are you know, people taken on board in a year? And I'm like, oh, it could be you know, in California. I'm like, well, you know, that's really hard to estimate. But MUFON reports this and New Fork. Right, right. And, you know, it could be yeah. hundreds. And then they spliced it to be per day. Hundreds per day. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not what I said. That's what I'm not going to name the show, but there was a show I did, and I was talking about that scary night with the bright light, and da da, and there, and then they like it. It was shaped like a tic tac. I'm like, I never said the word tic tac. <laughs> I never said it was, yeah. could have been a tic tac. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't see it. I just saw a bright light. Could have been a tic tac, I suppose. But they had to throw that that tic tac in there, yeah. and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> but I get it. I get what they're doing. It's okay. Well. All, good. all right, well, we still, still have about five minutes. So, is there anything else you want to add? Well, I, I, I could just, I mean, we could talk a little bit about um, fun conferences coming up with Fun Symposium coming up. Uh, it's the time of year to get out there and go to these conferences. Um, like I said, just came back from Contact in the Desert, which was a fantastic event, and, and meeting Linda Moulton Howe, whom I have a deep and utmost respect for this woman after being able to visit with her. And I, and I just want to say like, my mind was blown at how hard this woman works. <laughs> so, I mean, sure. she's like, she, oh. what I took away from that. And um, she's like, I get up at seven 25 in the morning. I'm like, not seven 30, not seven 20. She's not seven 25. And she's going 18 hours straight. I mean, this wow. woman was just fantastic to, to get to know and meet. So that was fantastic. And I, I hope to see a lot of you there out at the MUFON symposium in Cincinnati. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, you're Are you guys going to, do you guys have any good things going on? Preston and Dolly? Um, poss possibly in a conference in, gosh, where is it? In October. Kansas, in Kansas? Right? Yeah, I think it's Kansas. Oh, in Kansas. Yeah. 
Kansas. Oh, cool. I'll have to look into that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I know Roswell has a UFO Fest coming up um, end of June into, I think it goes until July 3rd, right before 4th of July. Uh, I was going to try and make it out for that, but circumstances has taken another toll for me. So I'm not going to be out there at Roswell, but um, yeah. So I just encourage your listeners to get out there and check those out. Yeah, I think you should out. search. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Stay, yeah. staying really busy. Um, and uh, you know, the ranch is not my only um, thing that I research. I'm also um, searching a Roswell body Denver connection that I've been almost almost four years now looking into this. So there was a Brigadier General Arthur Exxon that was rumored one of the Roswell bodies ended up in a mortuary outfit in Denver. And all I could tell you about that really quickly, it was there, there was an Eisenhower connection, uh, a Nixon connection with a federal judge, um, Lowry, Fitzsimmons, Mason Lodge. And I've been going to archives, the, Eis the Eisenhower library there in Elbeling and doing research on that. COVID shut it down when we hit COVID and all the archives, archival places closed down. Um, and I, I'm ex excited to kind of set the ranch side a little, dig back into this Roswell Denver body connection. Cause I think there's really something to that. So, you know, that's my other love. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's good that people are applying science to all of this. Here's yeah. John Groves. Hi, John. He's someone I met years ago. Great show. I know about Dr. Melba K Ketchum's DNA work into Sasquatch. So this is another opportunity. There's so much room for research in these fields. Right. So it's very, very cool. And here's a question real quick for Dolly. And it says, from Donna's happy hour, Dolly, do you get downloads of information from the ETs? Yes. Mm, yeah, It's not like a download. It's like direct communication. And uh, it, it's um, from practiced communicating with them for years and years and years. My my craft contact, Talada, I'm always in contact with, and I'm always in contact with Mama. Sometimes they don't answer me, and they go a few days without me hearing from them, and then I'll hear again. So, yeah. Yeah, I think all of us actually get that. Some of us just don't recognize it as such, but we all get That's inspiration true. and guidance. And the synchronicity, yeah. I'm sure you've experienced this, Katie, oh, in this field. Mind-blowing <laughs> synchronicities. Um, yeah, I mean, chart. one in particular, talking about the Roswell body, um, I was investigating the federal judge that hold on this body, blah, blah, blah. So my mom's living in an assisted living um, thing, and I gave a presentation called UFOs 101, and I was talking about the Roswell body and the federal judge and on and on. And they're like, oh, so-and-so, they named his name. His widow's on the fifth floor. You want me to go get her? And I'm just like, how does that happen? And you know, you know, Dolly, you were there during the synchronicities in San Francisco that happened. So yeah. so many synchronicities. Yeah. That I have crazy. some real interesting things to talk to you about crazy. that case. Yeah. That the one you're looking into now, we got to talk. Absolutely. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Almost being guided, right? I mean. Yes. Yeah. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. I mean, this was yeah. just brought uh I was just talking about this last week, not kidding. And I'll talk to you about it. Okay. 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 All right. Well, we're going to have to close up the show, I guess. We're pretty much yeah. coming up to that point. And I don't want to go okay. over because that always creates headaches that we don't need. Right. But, wow, Katie, that's so exciting that you're I know. I know. boots on the ground researcher. That's the kind of research I actually really enjoy. Oh, you know, thank you. Reading about thank you for and, having me on, Preston and Dolly. It was a pleasure to be <laughs> here. And thank you to all your listeners, too. Yep. All right. Yep, so you, you want to awesome. give out your uh, Facebook page or any emails or anything? Yeah, you, you can just you can find my contact information and you can contact me at Katie, K-A-T-I-E, page, P-A-I-G-E dot net. That's my website. And you can contact me there and I'll get your email. If you, if you have any more questions or, you know, any insider information, reach out to me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. And what, what's Sounds your book good. called again? It's called Letters of Love and Light. So that you, there's a link for that book on my website as well. And you can find it on Amazon. So. Perfect. Okay. Very yeah. cool. That's well, very thanks right. very much, Katie. It was awesome. Well, thank I know the Right. People in chat loved it too. So <laughs> definitely getting all kinds of really wonderful comments. 
Oh, yes, Stacy. There's my buddy, Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Uh, <laughs> we just hung out at contact in the desert. So all right. That's all right. very cool. All Preston, right. Well, thank you. All right. Wrap it up. Well, thank you all for showing up. We are coming to you from New Orleans at uh, the United uh, UPRN. It's easier for me to say that United Paranormal Radio Network at 107.7 FM and 105.3 FM. Uh, out of New Orleans, and uh, we're so glad you all showed up today. Please check us out for our next show. And Katie, there's going to be another day. Okay, we got to do this again. All right. Yes. We absolutely. After do. the show airs, have me back so we can talk about it all. <laughs> yes, I would love <laughs> right. to. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Awesome. So, night, night, everybody. Thanks very much for watching. Until next time, you've been watching the Light Gate. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>